Act Two of Alice in Wonderland by Alice Gernstenberg. Scene. The March Hare's garden, showing part of the Duchess's house. On a small platform there is a tea table, set with many cups, continuing into the wings to give the impression of limitless length. The March Hare, Hatter, and Dormouse are crowded at one end. Alice sits on the ground where she has been dropped from the sky. Finding herself not bruised, she rises and approaches the table. No room. No room. There's plenty of room. She sits in a large armchair at one end of the table. I don't know who you are. I am the March Hare, that's the Hatter, and this is the Dormouse. Have some wine. I don't see any wine. There isn't any. Then it wasn't very civil of you to offer it. It wasn't very civil of you to sit down without being invited. I didn't know it was your table. It's made for a great many more than three. Your hair wants cutting. You should learn not to make personal remarks. It's very rude. Why is a raven like a writing desk? Come, we shall have some fun now. I'm glad you've begun asking riddles. I believe I can guess that. So you mean you think you can find out the answer to it? Exactly so. Then you should say what you mean. I do. At least, at least I mean what I say. That's the same thing, you know. Not the same thing a bit. Why, you might just as well say that I see what I eat is the same thing as I eat what I see. You might as well say that I like what I get is the same as I get what I like. You might just as well say that I breathe when I sleep is the same thing as I sleep when I breathe. It is the same thing with you. Takes out his watch, looks at it uneasily, shakes it, holds it to his ear. What day of the month is it? The fourth. Two days wrong. I told you butter wouldn't suit the works. It was the best butter. Yes, but some crumbs must have got in as well. You shouldn't have put it in with the bread knife. The March Hare takes the watch, looks at it gloomily, dips it into his cup of tea, and looks at it again, but doesn't know what else to say. It was the best butter, you know. What a funny watch! It tells the day of the month and doesn't tell what o'clock it is. Why should it? Does your watch tell you what year it is? Of course not. But that's because it stays the same year for such a long time together. Which is just the case with mine. I don't quite understand you. What you said had no sort of meaning in it, and yet it was certainly English. The Hatter pours some hot tea onto the Dormouse's nose. The Dormouse is asleep again. Of course, of course. Just what I was going to remark myself. Have you guessed the riddle yet? No, I give it up. What's the answer? I haven't the slightest idea. Nor I. I think you might do something better with the time than wasting it in asking riddles that have no answers. If you knew time as well as I do, you wouldn't talk about wasting it. It's him. I don't know what you mean. Of course you don't. I dare say you never even spoke to time. Perhaps not. But I know I have to beat time when I learn music. Ah,、uh, that accounts for it. He won't stand beating. Now, if you only kept on good terms with him, he'd do almost anything you liked with the clock. For instance, suppose it were nine o'clock in the morning, just time to begin lessons. You'd only have to whisper a hint to time, and round goes the clock in a twinkling, half past one. Time for dinner. I only wish it was. That would be grand, certainly. But then, I shouldn't be hungry for it, you know. Not at first, perhaps. But you could keep it to half past one as long as you like. Is that the way you manage? Not I. We quarrelled last March, just before he went mad. You know, it was at the great concert given by the Queen of Hearts, and I had. To sing, twinkle, twinkle, little bat, how I wonder what you're at. You know the song, perhaps. I've heard something like it.
Twinkle, twinkle, twinkle. Well, I'd hardly finished the first verse when the queen bawled out, "He's murdering the time off with his head!" How dreadfully savage! And ever since that, he won't do a thing. I ask. It's always six o'clock now. Is that the reason so many tea things are put out here? Yes, that's it. It's always tea time, and we've no time to wash. The things between whiles. Then you keep moving round, I suppose. Exactly. So as the things get used up. But when you come to the beginning again. Suppose we change the subject. I vote the young lady tells us a story. I'm afraid I don't know one. Then, Then the, the dormouse, dormouse shall. shall. Wake, Wake up, up dormouse. dormouse. They pinch him on both sides at once. The dormouse opens his eyes slowly and says in a hoarse, feeble voice, "I wasn't asleep. I heard every word you fellows were saying." Tell us a story. Yes, please do. And be quick about it, or you'll be asleep again before it's done. Once upon a time, there were three little sisters, and their names were Elsie, Lacy, and Tilly, and they lived at the bottom of a well. What do they live on? They lived on treacle. They couldn't have done that, you know. They'd have been ill. So they were very ill. But why did they live at the bottom of a well? Have some more tea. I've had nothing yet, so I can't take more. You mean you can't take less? It's very easy to take more than nothing. Nobody asked your opinion. Who's making personal remarks? No. Alice helps herself to tea and bread and butter. Why do they live at the bottom of a well? The dormouse takes a minute or two to think. Hmm. It was a treacle well. There is no such thing. Shush! Shush! If you can't be civil, you'd better finish the story for yourself. No, please go on. I won't interrupt you again. I dare say there may be one. One indeed. And so these three little sisters, they were learning to draw, you know. What did they draw? Treacle. I want a clean cup. Let's all move one place on. Pasha moves on. Dormouse takes his place. March Hare takes Dormouse's place, and Alice unwillingly takes March Hare's place. I'm worse off than I was before. You've upset the milk jug into your plate. It wasn't very civil of you to sit down without being invited. Where did they draw the treacle from? You can draw water out of a water well, so I should think you could draw treacle out of a treacle well. Am I stupid? But they were in the well. Of course they were. Well in. They were learning to draw, and they drew all manner of things. Everything that begins with an M. Why with an M? Why not? Alice is silent and confused. Patrick pinches Dormouse to wake him up. The Dormouse wakes up with a little shriek and continues. Eek! That begins with an M, such as mouse traps and the moon and memory and muchness. You know you say things are much of a muchness. Did you ever see such a thing as a drawing of a muchness? Did you? Really? Now you ask me. I don't think. Then you shouldn't talk. No. Alice rises and walks away. You are very rude. It's the stupidest tea party I ever was at in all my life. The white rabbit enters carrying a huge envelope with a seal and crown on it. No room. No room. Rabbit pays no attention to them, but goes to the house and raps loudly. A footman in livery with a round face and large eyes, like a frog, and powdered hair, opens the door. For the Duchess, an invitation from the Queen to play croquet. From the Queen, an invitation for the Duchess to play croquet. White Rabbit bows and goes out. No room. No room. No room. No room. No room. The frog disappears into the room, but leaves the door open. There is a terrible din, and many saucepans fly out. <sighs> She's at it again.
It's perfectly disgusting. Let's move on. The platform moves off with the table, chairs, March Hare, Hatter, and Dormouse. Meanwhile, the frog has come out again and is sitting near the closed door, staring stupidly at the sky. Alice goes to the door timidly and knocks. There's no sort of use in knocking, and that for two reasons. First, because I'm on the same side of the door as you are. Secondly, because they're making such a noise inside, no one can possibly hear you. Please, then, how am I to get in? There might be some sense in your knocking if we had the door between us. For instance, if you were inside, you might knock and I could let you out, you know. How am I to get in? I shall sit here till tomorrow. The door opens and a large plate skims out straight at the frog's head. It grazes his nose and breaks into pieces. The frog acts as if nothing had happened. Or next day, maybe. How am I to get in? Are you to get in at all? That's the first question, you know. It's really dreadful the way all you creatures argue. It's enough to drive one crazy. I shall sit here on and off for days and days. But what am I to do? Anything you like. He begins to whistle. Where's the servant whose business it is to answer the door? Which door? This door, of course. The frog looks at the door and rubs his thumb on it to see if the paint will come off. To answer the door? What's it been asking for? I don't know what you mean. I speaks English, doesn't I? Or are you deaf? What did it ask you? Nothing. I've been knocking at it. Shouldn't do that. Shouldn't do that. Vexes it, you know. He kicks the door. You let it alone. And it'll let you alone, you know. Oh, there's no use talking to you. She starts to open the door just as the Duchess comes out carrying a pig in baby's clothes. She sneezes. Frog sneezes and Alice sneezes. If everybody minded her own business... <laughs> it's Peppa. Of course, my cook puts it in the soup. There's certainly too much Peppa in the soup. Sneeze then and get rid of it. Duchess begins to sing to the baby, giving it a violent shake at the end of every line of the lullaby. Speak roughly to your little boy and beat him when he sneezes. Frog and Alice sneeze. Achoo. He only does it to annoy because he knows it teases. Duchess sneezes. Frog sneezes. Alice sneezes. Achoo. Achoo. I speak severely to my boy. I beat him when he sneezes. Frog sneezes. Alice sneezes. Achoo. For he can thoroughly enjoy the pepper when he pleases. Duchess sneezes. Frog sneezes. Alice sneezes. Duchess gasps and gives a tremendous sneeze. Achoo. 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 Oh dear. She jumps aside as kettles and pots come flying out of the door. The Duchess pays no attention. What a cook to have! She calls inside. Oh, please mind what you're doing. Another pan comes out and almost hits the baby. Oh, there goes his precious nose! If everybody minded her own business, the world would go round a deal faster than it does. Which would not be an advantage. Just think what work it would make with the day and night. You see the earth takes 24 hours to turn round on its axis. Talking of axes, chop off her head. The head of a grinning Cheshire cat appears in a tree above a wall. Oh, what's that? Cat, of course. Why does it grin like that? It's a Cheshire cat, and that's why. To baby. Pig. I didn't know that Cheshire cats always grinned. In fact, I didn't know that cats could grin. They all can, and most of them do. I don't know of any that do. You don't know much, and that's a fact. Here, you may nurse it a bit if you like. Flings the baby at Alice. I must go and get ready to play croquet with the queen. She goes into the house. If I don't take this child away with me, they're sure to kill it in a day or two. Cheshire Puss, 
Would you tell me, please, which way I ought to walk from here? That depends a good deal on where you want to get to. I don't much care where. Then it doesn't matter which way you walk. So long as I get somewhere. Oh, you're sure to do that if you only walk long enough. Please, will you tell me what sort of people live about here? All mad people. But I don't want to go among mad people. Oh, you can't help that. We're all mad here. I'm mad. He's mad. He's dreaming now. And what do you think he's dreaming about? Alice goes to the frog to scrutinize his face. Nobody could guess that. Why? About you. And if he left off dreaming about you, where do you suppose you'd be? Where I am now, of course. Not you. You'd be nowhere. Why? You're only a sort of thing in his dream, and you're mad too. How do you know I'm mad? You must be, or you wouldn't have come here. How do you know that you're mad? To begin with, a dog's not mad. You grant that. I suppose so. Well then, you see, a dog growls when it's angry and wags its tail when it's pleased. Now I growl when I'm pleased and wag my tail when I'm angry. Therefore, I'm mad. I call it purring, not growling. Call it what you like. Do you play croquet with the queen today? I should like it very much, but I haven't been invited yet. You'll see me there. Vanishes. Alice to the squirming baby. Oh dear! It's heavy and so ugly. Don't grunt. Oh, oh! It's a pig. Please, Mr. Footman, take it. Frog rises with dignity, whistles, and disappears into the house. A kettle comes bounding out. Alice puts pig down, and it crawls off. The cat appears again. By the by, what became of the baby? It turned into a pig. I thought it would. Vanishes. Frog comes out of the house with hedgehogs and flamingos. Cat reappears. Did you say pig or fig? I said pig, and I wish you wouldn't keep appearing and vanishing so suddenly. You make one quite giddy. All right. It vanishes slowly. Frog puts flamingos down and re-enters the house. While Alice is examining the flamingos curiously, Tweedledum and Tweedledee, each with an arm around the other's neck, sidestep in and stand looking at Alice. Alice turns, sees them, starts in surprise, and involuntarily whispers, "Tweedle, D." Doom. If you think we're waxworks, you ought to pay. Contrarywise, if you think we're alive, you ought to speak. The first thing in a visit to say is how do you do and shake hands. The brothers give each other a hug, then hold out the two hands that are free to shake hands with her. Alice does not like shaking hands with either of them first, for fear of hurting the other one's feelings. She takes hold of both hands at once, and they all dance around in a ring, quite naturally to music. Here we go around the mulberry bush. But would you tell me which road leads out of? What shall I repeat to her? The Vorus and the Capente is uh, the longest. He gives his brother an affectionate hug. The sun was shining. If it's very long, would you please tell me first which road? The moon was shining sulkily. The sea was wet. As wet could be. Oh, oysters, come and walk with us. The walrus did beseech. A pleasant walk, a pleasant talk along the briny beach. The elf's oyster winked his eye and shook his heavy head, meaning to say he did not choose to leave the oyster bed. But four young oysters hurried up, and yet another four. And thick and fast they came at last, and more and more and more. The walrus and the carpenter walked a mile or so, and then they rested on a rock, conveniently low. And all the little oysters stood waiting in a row. A loaf of bread, the walrus said, is what we chiefly need. Now, if you're ready, oysters, dear, we can begin to feed. But not on us! The oysters cried, turning a little blue. The night is fine, the walrus said. Do you admire the view? The carpenter said nothing, but 
cut us another slice. I wish you were not quite so deep. I've had to ask you twice. It seems a shame, the walrus said, to play such a trick after you've brought them so far and made them trot so quick. Oh, oysters, said the carpenter. You've had a pleasant run. Shall we be trotting home again? But answer came them none. This was scarcely odd because... They'd eaten every... Did you see that? D interrupts in a passion, pointing to a white rattle on the ground. It's only a rattle. Dumb stamps wildly and tears his hair. I knew it was. It spoiled, of course, my nice new rattle. To D. You agree to have a battle? He collects saucepans and pots. D picks up a saucepan. I suppose so. Let's fight till dinner. They go out hand in hand. Alice hears music. I wonder what is going to happen next. She backs downstage respectfully as the king and queen of hearts enter, followed by the knave of hearts carrying the king's crown on a crimson velvet cushion, and the white rabbit and others. When they come opposite to Alice, they stop and look at her. The duchess comes out of her house. Who is this? The knave bows three times, smiles, and giggles. <laughs> Idiot. What's your name, child? My name is Alice, so please your majesty. Off with her head! Off nonsense! Consider, my dear, she is only a child. Can you play croquet? Yes. Come on, then. Get to your places. Where are the mallets? Here. The frog appears with the flamingos and hedgehogs. Off with his head! No one pays her any attention. What fun. What is the fun? Why, she, it's all her fancy that. They never execute anyone. What does one do? Get to your places! She takes the flamingo, uses its neck as a mallet, and the hedgehog as a ball. The frog doubles himself into an arch. The king does the same with the flowers, and the knave offers himself as an arch for Alice. Even though Alice does not notice him, he holds the arch position. The queen shouts at intervals, Off with his head! Off with her head! Where are the chess queens? Under sentence of execution. What for? Did you say, what a pity? No, I didn't. I don't think it's at all a pity. I said, what for? They boxed the queen's ears. Alice gives a little scream of laughter. Oh, hush. The queen will hear you. You see, they came rather late. And the queen said, oh dear, the queen hears me. He hurries away. Alice notices the knave who is still pretending to be an arch. How can you go on thinking so quietly with your head downwards? What does it matter where my body happens to be? My mind goes on working just the same. The fact of it is, the more head downwards I am, the more I keep on inventing new things. Did you happen to meet any soldiers, my dear, as you came through the wood? Yes, I did. Several thousand, I should think. Four thousand two hundred and seven. That's the exact number. They couldn't send all the horses, you know, because two of them are wanted in the game. And I haven't sent the two messengers either. What's the war about? The Red Chess King has the whole army against us. But he can't kill a man who has thirteen hearts. The Duchess, Queen, Frog, and followers go out. The knave and the five spot, seven spot, and nine spot of hearts stand behind the king. Just look along the road and tell me if you can see either of my messengers. I see nobody on the road. I only wish I had such eyes to be able to see nobody, and at that distance too. Why, it's as much as I can do to see real people by this light. I see somebody now. But he's coming so very slowly, and what curious attitudes he goes into, skipping up and down and wriggling like an eel. Not at all. Those are Anglo-Saxon attitudes. He only does them when he's happy. I must have two messengers, you know, to come and go. One to come, and one to go. 
I beg your pardon? It isn't respectable to beg. I only meant that I didn't understand. Why one to come and one to go? Don't I tell you? I must have two to fetch and carry. One to fetch and one to carry. The March Hare enters, pants for breath, waves his hands about and makes fearful faces at the king. <gasps> you allow me. I feel faint. Give me a ham sandwich. Another sandwich! <sighs> There's nothing but hay left now. Hey, then, there's nothing like eating hay when you're faint. I should think throwing cold water over you would be better. I didn't say there was nothing better. I said there was nothing like it. Who did you pass on the road? Nobody. Quite right. This young lady saw him, too. So, of course, nobody walks slower than you. I do my best. I'm sure nobody walks faster than I do. He can't do that, or else he'd have been here first. However, now you've got your breath, you may tell us what's happened in the town. I'll whisper it. Much to Alice's surprise, he shouts into the king's ear. They're at it again. Do you call that a whisper? If you do such a thing again, I'll have you buttered. It went through and through my head like an earthquake. The king and the March Hare go out, followed by the five, seven, and nine spots. The duchess runs in and tucks her arm affectionately into Alice's. You can't think how glad I am to see you again, you dear old thing. Oh! You're thinking about something, my dear, and that makes you forget to talk. I can't tell you just now what the moral of that is, but I shall remember in a bit. Perhaps it hasn't one. Tut, tut, child. Everything's got a moral, if only you can find it. Squeezes closely, digs her chin into Alice's shoulder, and roughly drags Alice along for a walk. The game's going on rather better now. Tis so, and the moral of that is, Oh, tis love, tis love, that makes the world go round. Somebody said that it's done by everybody minding their own business. Ah, oh, well, it means much the same thing. And the moral of that is, take care of the sense, and the sounds will take care of themselves. How fond you are of finding morals in things. I dare say you're wondering why I don't put my arm around your waist. The reason is that I'm doubtful about the temper of your flamingo. Shall I try the experiment? He might bite. Very true. Flamingos and mustard both bite. And the moral of that is, birds of a feather flock together. Only mustard isn't a bird. Right as usual. What a clear way you have of putting things. It's a mineral, I think. Of course it is. There's a large mustard mine near here. And the moral of that is, the more there is of mine, the less there is of yours. Oh, I know. It's a vegetable. It doesn't look like one, but it is. I quite agree with you, and the moral of that is, be what you would seem to be. Or, if you'd like it put more simply, never imagine yourself to be otherwise than what it might appear to others that what you were or might have been was not otherwise than what you had been would have appeared to them to be otherwise. I think I should understand that better if I had it written down, but I can't quite follow it as you say it. That's nothing to what I could say if I chose. Pray, don't trouble yourself to say it any longer than that. Oh, don't talk about trouble. I make you a present of everything I've said as yet. Hmm. Thinking again. I've got a right to think. Just about as much right as pigs have to fly. And the moral... The arm of the Duchess begins to tremble and her voice dies down. The Queen of Hearts stands before them with folded arms and frowning like a thunderstorm. A fine day, Your Majesty. Now, I give you fair warning. Either you or your head must be off, and that in about half no time. Take your choice. The Duchess goes meekly into the house. Let's go on with the game. She goes off and shouts at intervals, Off with his head! Off with her head! How are you getting on? It's no use speaking to you till your ears have come. 
I don't think they play at all fairly, and they all quarrel so, and they don't seem to have any rules in particular, and you've no idea how confusing it is with all the things alive. There's the arch I've got to go through next, walking about at the other end of the ground, and I should have croqueted the Queen's hedgehog just now, only it ran away when it saw mine coming. Music begins. How do you like the Queen? Not at all. She's so extremely. The king, queen, and the entire court enters. The queen is near to Alice. The music stops, and all look at Alice questioningly. Alice tries to propitiate the queen. Likely, to win. Music continues. That it's hardly worth while finishing the game. Queen smiles and passes on. Who are you talking to? It's a friend of mine, a Cheshire cat. Allow me to introduce it. I don't like the look of it at all. However, it may kiss my hand if it likes. I'd rather not. Don't be impertinent, and don't look at me like that. A cat may look at a king. I've read that in some book, but I don't remember where. Well, it must be removed, my dear. I wish you would have this cat removed. Off with his head! But you can't cut off a head unless there's a body to cut it off from. Anything that has a head can be beheaded. If something isn't done about it in less than no time, I'll have everybody executed all round. It belongs to the Duchess. You'd better ask her about it. It's a lie. You'd better ask me. Do it if you can. It grins away. The Duchess and Frog escape into the house. Cut it off. It's gone. 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 Where? 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 Cut it off! Cut them all off! No! 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 Save me! Save me! The knave shouts to Alice and gives her a tart for safety. Take a tart. The queen sees Alice stand out a moment from the others. Cut hers off! Cut hers off! The others are glad to distract the queen's attention from themselves. Cut hers off! Cut hers off! Cut hers off! Alice cries in fear and takes a quick bite at the tart. If there is a trap door on the stage, Alice disappears down it, leaving the crowd circling around the hole, screaming in amaze. If the stage has no trap door, a bridge is built across the footlights with a stair leading down into the orchestra pit. When the crowd is chasing Alice, she jumps over the footlights onto the bridge as the curtain is falling, dividing her from the crowd as she appeals to the audience. Save me! Save me! Who will save me? And runs down the stairs and disappears. Curtain. End of Act Two.